From Los Angeles, the home of film and television, this is Film Music Live, a webcast featuring outstanding composers, orchestrators, filmmakers, and more from the world of music for film, television, and video games, talking about their work and answering your questions. Film Music Live is sponsored by the Film Music Network and Film Music Institute. And now the host of Film Music Live, Daniel Schweiger. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Schweiger, and welcome to Film Music Live, the show where you get to ask the questions to today's top composers. I'm happy to have you here at the start of 2021 for our YouTube page debut, as well as continuing on the Film Music Network page on Facebook. When the love of everything 80s started to flood cable television, maybe the last nostalgic move anyone expected was seeing the Karate Kid reborn on YouTube in a way that brought a new emotional dimension to the enduring martial arts rivalry between Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence, while also appealing to the dojos of a new generation. No more important to Cobra Kai street cred was its scoring by Leo Bernberg and Zach Robinson that not only brought vitality to composer Bill Conti's iconic movie themes and symphonic style, but also in the way they're scoring rocked 80s guitars and electronics to make Cobra Kai anything but a musical time capsule. Now, with Season 3 on Netflix, Cobra Kai brings back such film favorites as Martin Cove and Elizabeth Shuey to the Karate Kid fold, while mythically intensifying the rivalry between the Miyagi-Do and Cobra Kai dojos. From Martin Kreese's origin to prize student Miguel fighting his way back from a wheelchair, Zack and Leo take their Cobra Kai scoring to orchestral heights as epic as Bill Conti's while shredding guitar, retro synths, Asian instruments, and voices like never before, from Okinawa to Vietnam and the San Fernando Valley. They're a musical team who not only channel the Karate Kid spirit, but most importantly, its musical soul for the ultimate frenemies, Daniel and Johnny. And now here to talk about sweeping the scoring legs like never before for Cobra Kai are composers Leo Bernberg and Zach Robinson. Welcome to Film Music Live, dudes. Hey, 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 hey. Hey. Thanks for having us. Great that was to a have fun you video. I liked that video. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> Well, a, a big thanks to Kathy for assembling that. And again, you, I just want to tell uh, all you YouTubers and Facebookers who are on deck, we've got uh, five CDs of the first season of Cobra Kai that La La Land Records is uh, generously donating. So first five questions in America, have them on deck. So I guess let's get back to the beginning. Uh, Leo and Zach, tell us about your own musical origin story and how your own dojo fused for Cobra Kai. Um, our, uh, our own dojo, uh, <laughs> let's see, Zach and I have known each other since 2012, which man, now is a long time. It is, it is hard to remember that it is like 2021. 20, um, we actually met, uh, working at, uh, Sensei Christoph Beck's studio. Uh, we were both, uh, studio assistants of his, um, Zach loves to say that on day one, uh, he came in on an, as an intern and I asked him to make me coffee. Uh, and I do not remember if that happened or not, but I, I would like the record to reflect that I have since gotten Zach many coffees. Um, but uh, we, we just gelled right away as friends and collaborators at Chris's. Um, we, ha we both have a very kind of... Uh, unique uh, musical background well not like we have different musical backgrounds but that have like a lot of heavy overlap if it was a venn diagram um i grew up as a saxophone player flute player uh clarinet player played in like jazz band wind ensemble did a ton of uh studying voice sang a lot of choirs did a ton of musical theater wrote music for some theater productions in my high school um and zach uh comes at things from more of a guitar player's uh, aspect. I'll let him speak to his own background, but we we found we had a lot of sort of shared musical, uh, like a library of experiences uh, between all the things that interest us. And I think that just kind of led naturally to us like wanting to make music together. Um, Zach, you got some, got some stuff to add to our origin story? Sure. Uh, yeah, as Leo hinted at, I have more of uh, like a rock band, um, pop, electronic music background, um, but I studied music composition at Northwestern 
and I'm from LA originally and I moved back to LA. Um, and that's how I kind of hooked up with Chris and company. Um, so yeah, my, my background, uh, it, it, it worked well with Cobra Kai in the sense that because we were going to, you know, to Johnny's perspective, we received Johnny's perspective and he's someone who never left the eighties and I'm a big eighties guy. Everything I do is like the thesis is revolves around the eighties. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it just, it, it ended up working out. And I think, um, as we'll talk about, I probably, as the interview goes on, just how much Cobra Kai truly represents Leo and I, like in its most perfect form. Now, how did the show come your way? Uh, we had um, done a YouTube Red show in, when it was YouTube Red uh, in around 2015. It was called Sing It. Um, and it was a small show, but we had worked together. Uh, we had left Chris's place to do this project. And then when we saw that Cobra Kai was in the trades, uh, we knew nothing about it. There was no announcement that Ralph Macchio or Billy Zabka were reprising their roles. We knew nothing. They hadn't started shooting or anything. But we saw YouTube Red and we said, oh, we have a relationship with them already. Why don't we just put together like a real... Who knows what the show is going to be like? Could be fun. But our reel consisted of um, a lot of like orchestral music, a la Conti, kind of like Japanese influenced orchestral music, um, and then tons of 80s stuff, like tons of kind of like 80s rock and electronic synthwave stuff. Um, and that got to our agent, who then got it to John, Josh, and Hayden, who we will call JJH for now on in this interview. Um, <laughs> and uh, got to JJH, and they heard it, and they said, How did these guys know that? this is what we wanted to do without hearing anything. So it was kind of a shot in the dark, but once we met with them, um, we clicked immediately and it was really um, pretty rare experience actually to be able to like find something, seek it out, get a meeting and then get it is like, that doesn't happen that often. Now tell me about establishing the musical template of the series, just kind of getting that sound down. Yeah. The, we we sort of set up, uh, th there's like a master palette, which is this hair metal meets synth wave meets like cinematic orchestral scoring with some Japanese influences uh, along the way. Uh, but that, that kind of master palette um, can kind of, you can kind of break it down into three sort of sub uh, little sound worlds that then we would set off to play with each other. So in season one, kind of the first home base we wanted to establish was because this series is Cobra Kai and not the Karate Kid, we wanted to find the sound of Johnny Lawrence. Um, you know, your your sort of has been peaked in high school adult in, in the late uh, 2010s, uh, who's uh, a little lost himself. And uh, that, we, we put a lot of 80s hair metal influence in that. A lot of guitars, a lot of drums, a lot of rock sounds. We love to say that that sort of Johnny palette is the music that he hears for himself in his head, especially when it is like particularly badass action stuff. Especially um, when it's badass. Especially, especially when it's badass. Cause he is all about, if you've seen the show, which I'm sure everyone has, uh, you know, being a badass. Uh, palette number two is kind of the contrast of that. And it's more of the uh, Miyagi, um, Daniel mysticism role. And so like we occasionally nod to Bill Conti's themes, but it's more like a palette connection in terms of like um, sort of Japanese flutes, uh, synth flutes in particular to, to sort of lean into our 80s retro vibe. Um, and then like a lot of orchestra. Uh, we record a ton of orchestra on this show and it sort of started in that sound world, but then has since become like a major thread through all of it. And then our third sound world um, is, has to do with the younger generation of the Karate Kid story now, which is really like central to the show. Like it's about Cobra Kai. We are sort of bringing back the, as the interest of the frenemies that are uh, Daniel and, and Johnny. Um, but like the canvas that they have to paint their uh, their good and their their ill uh, is really on this new generation of fighters, which involves uh, both of their children and uh, a whole whole other uh, cast that uh, people have have known and loved. And, and for that palette, we we kind of um, we sort of leaned into the synth pop '80s sound a little bit, and then like updated it. Uh, 
for us, uh, one one really identifying feature about the original Karate Kid films is the songs that are in it. I think a lot of people, when they think of the music for the, those movies, they think like Young Hearts, like they think uh, those those poppy um, needle drops. Uh, and we didn't we we don't have the same kind of interaction in Cobra Kai between like needle drop songs and the score. But what we wanted to do was make the score feel like it was infused by that sound so that like, as you're watching the show, it all feels like that same palette from, from the original movies. You know, for me, like, I think a big reason is a super Karate Kid fan, uh, you know, fan of the Bill Conti movies and just basically everything 80s. For me, a major reason the show works is that it loves the characters and it has fun with them, but it's not condescending. You know, it's not, you know, making fun of uh, of these seminal films. I mean, how important was it for you to find that tone where you could have fun but not make fun of it? And especially with how soap opera-ish the show yeah. can get. You know, it's it's funny because, like, I think we kind of do make fun of it a little bit. But it's, but it's like, everyone's kind of in on the joke. Like, you're not, you're not making fun in, like, a mean way. You're making fun in, like, you're, you're having fun. I guess you put it that way. But, like, that was kind of our, uh, what, I think the reason we clicked so well with, with the showrunners is because they, they too kind of, like, recognize in this alternate reality where karate where there's no guns and karate disputes settle everything like that this is just like the universe they've built and we've got to you know not take it too seriously um but you can still respect the the you know the characters and their motivations and their emotions and that's what i think makes it so sincere but in terms of the music like we new going in and we still say this all the time that like we completely embrace the cheese that is you know 80s music and and not just 80s like rock or electronic music just 80s orchestral music which like a lot of the bill conti score is pretty what people would say cheesy i think but we love it like that's not a that's not a a diss at all i mean we we completely lean into it and um it's always so funny to me when people say like oh it's so cheesy like but i can't stop watching and i was like what do you mean but like it's so cheesy like and you can't stop watching like it's <laughs> it's that's yeah. just like that is the point um yeah. and i we love that they just like lean into it so hard the show runs. yeah i think the th- the show is very self aware but it it treats everyone's emotions like zach said very genuinely and we treat the score very genuinely and the way we score the drama we try to keep as genuine as possible and in the process that makes it fun like it keeps it like really fun because like it like look every tv show that has ever been made if it has enough episodes there will eventually be like an 80s training montage Every sitcom, every multicam, every mm. single cam, like animation. So it is. If you make enough episodes, there will be an '80s training montage. And in our first meeting with JJH, the or like our pitch meeting, one thing we said is like, what what would be really exciting about the show to us is to write and like an actual '80s training montage, like not a joke. We want like the actual training montage where like you are in it with the main character and. Uh, you know, one of the tracks on, on in season one kind of became that slither it is. Um, but, uh, you know, just as like the actual example, but that is sort of the approach we take to every, you know, influence of score. Um, Cause it's all just kind of become this super palette at this point. We just try to like channel that stuff as genuinely as possible in like executing the storytelling. And I think it makes it really fun. You know, for me, it's, uh, no, let's talk about season three. I mean, it, this is like, a literally an operatic season. I mean, he just come off of <laughs> yeah. the mother of all, the mother of all high school fights where everyone should have just been completely expelled <laughs> at, at the end of that. Um, but this season, one thing I really is just, I mean, talk about bingeable. I, I went through this like in two days, just like, Oh like, yeah. Uh, it's, you can't uh, stop once you hit. You can't like, stop. Five. Yeah. But this season really seems to be, you know, the first season was kind of Bill Conti. The second was kind of retro rock electronics. This season is like much more orchestra at least to my ears. And I mean, there is some thunderous uh, scoring in this uh, particular season. It's a nice Thank adjective. You. Yeah, thunder. I like that. Thank, Thank you. you. Keep <laughs> using that. Uh, the, you know, the this season 
it really widens the scope of of the story and the universe uh, you know the the uh karate kid cinematic universe we this yeah. season takes us to okinawa like daniel goes back to okinawa we reconnect with uh kumiko and chosen from the second movie and and totally flesh out this like mythology to the to the miyagi do dojo and karate tradition on the flip side you've got john crease who is like quickly becoming literally the biggest bad guy in in cinema now uh like we delve into his whole backstory which takes us to like the vietnam war the 1970s and he's like off in the jungle and like how those experiences shaped him and like gave him his like very particular uh you know manipulative life philosophy of no mercy um and 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 sort of like once once the story pulls you in those like much wider directions like it's just like the scope is so big by the time you race to the conclusion and so there's no there's no way to do it except to like be operatic in a lot of ways it, it feels like a culmination of like all these seeds we've been planting the whole time in terms of palette and all the themes because it's a highly even since season one it's a highly thematic score and we've been setting up themes since the very first episode for characters and dojos and ideas and feelings and so like you know just the bigger the scope of the storytelling the more we can like weave them all together and like really take advantage of the fact that we are recording a 90 piece orchestra for this karate soap opera I mean, I got to tell you, I just love how the series references, you know, subgenres of 80s cinema. Mm -hmm. And in this one, it's missing an action land with Chuck Norris. Did you want to? <laughs> did you? Did you want to go back to even those kind of canon scores with the Vietnam, the Vietnam flashbacks? There's a few Vietnam ones that we, in particular, we were listening to Apocalypse Now. Early on, we knew they were going back to Vietnam, and we we weren't super familiar with Apocalypse Now, but like, there's so much synth stuff in that. Yeah, I love the I freaking love the movie, and I hadn't actually thought about the music in many, many years. And uh, let's see, we were we had started working on season three, and the Redux uh, they re released in in theaters, or like the Redux Redux. I can't remember Coppola is like always the tweaker. Um, but they re released that in 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 theaters, and I went to go see it, and I was like, oh my god, I forgot about all this like insane like detuned synth music as they're just like on the boat um and so we tried to channel some of that uh i thought it was pretty fun because that you know those those vietnam scenes are are such a uh i don't know like a a trip in a lot yeah. of ways we also um, did i would also say that the other kind of like 80s thing that we went really deep into was the sports movie angle of it um which we have a lot of kind of references to that very like uh like alan silvestri kind of like diatonic sweeping like um like musical like sports 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 moments particularly like when daniel walks into the all valley the empty all valley arena and you know the lights turn on boom 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 you hear like the lone the lone french horn playing the melody with the strings coming in it like we eat that shit up and like every time someone like understands the reference like we have so many references also not just 80 stuff but like people someone just tweeted at us yesterday and said like hey return to okinawa like is that like kind of princess mononoke influence or like yeah for sure <laughs> um so we're we're always throwing all that stuff in there we, we we have a lot of influences you know for me one of my favorite cues is the big uh the fight at the in the climactic episode and it's like you're having your way with christmas music <laughs> yes yeah that was uh they literally said there's going to be a christmas fight in this season and i you know so whatever that means yeah. to you, uh, <laughs> just score a Christmas fight. <laughs> now, how is it that having Elizabeth Shuey come back and to, to score her character? We didn't really uh, score that much of her, did we? We didn't. Yeah, we didn't have to do a lot. So I feel like a lot of the heavy lifting was some, uh, a lot of heavy lifting of that Journey song right before the, right. the big uh, finale fight. Um, but uh it's, I mean, it was really special because they had been building to that for like two seasons and like planted a couple Easter eggs, uh, you know, in, you know, in season one when Danny and Johnny, or when Daniel and Johnny are uh, 
like in the bar looking at her Facebook is like one of the funniest scenes. And right. then in season two, more, like, yeah. you, you know, the cliffhanger ending on top of Miguel's back being broken is like Allie's friend request. And <laughs> even this season, like up until episode nine, like you don't really know if she's going to show up. Like they kind of hint at it a bit and set up this kind of Facebook um, messaging plot. And so I, I think for like the fans and, and the OG fans, especially like, it was so huge to actually have her come. Um, there was one yeah. moment, there was one moment in particular that we did score that I remember being like, when we spotted it, it's when Elizabeth Shue walks into the, it's the first time that, that, that Allie sees Johnny in the restaurant. And I remember spotting that and be like, oh God, this is going to be like a pain in the ass to score. Like, they're gonna, <laughs> this is like, this is going to be like, what are they going to, this is like a huge Right, it's like the most moment, loaded huge reveal. Huge moment. Yeah. Um, and we ended up, it ended up being fine. I think it was a version one, but we we kind of channeled a little bit of, um, I feel like it's this kind of like post-punk guitar, kind of chorus guitar, almost like The Cure. Like it's got that very kind of like nostalgic, maybe a little bit later 80s. You know, maybe they're a little bit grown up when they're listening to that or are coming out of adolescence. And, and it, it has this kind of like that cure quality of this kind of like, like youthful remembrance. Um, and that's kind of what we were channeling with this stuff. There's a few very small cues with her and they're not even on the album. They're so short. Now, this gets us to our first question uh, from Funty. Uh, guys, great Thank job you. on the retro inflected scoring on the series thus far. I was Thank curious you. if any of you have a hand in selecting which pop songs get used. We do no. not. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, there's, uh, uh, there's a few, you know, there's a few, um, you know, last season, actually, I'm, re I'm remembering one. It, it, they're very, they're not. They're kind of inconsequential. They're kind of in the background, but like uh, I had almost a track from my my electronic music project was going to be in a kind of an eighties ish song playing in the background of the roller rink. Do you remember this, Leo? In yes, I remember in season this. two. And then we ended up the, the energy wasn't right, but uh, I think <laughs> we suggested like a few other synthwave artists, and they they went with them, so that was cool. But we often don't get to do that. Um, actually, though, we should point out Zach's incredible audio cameo in in season three which is what in is the it? uh in episode five <laughs> zach please tell this story it's just in episode five when they're at the d snyder concert there's just a they did not clear uh one of the songs that they were playing so you cut back and you see like a guitar shredder but he's actually not doing anything it's just me like i'm, I'm like <laughs> i'm dub i'm dubbing in what he's playing and i had to make a fake like twisted sister song so that's our hand in, in selecting yes. the source music. <laughs> it's just replacing it. <laughs> now, I'd love to talk about scoring the, the high school kids and especially the whole arc of Miguel getting out of that wheelchair because, you know, he definitely was not going to be Deputy uh, you know, Dan from Forrest Gump in this uh, particular season. <laughs> You want to take it, Leo? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, I mean, that's one of the, it's the big cliffhanger for season two. And it, it's kind of the, in a lot of ways, the heart of, of season three. I think the show, Zach and I always think like the show is really at its core when the Johnny Miguel relationship is on full display. Cause I think that's when you see Johnny at his best. And, you know, season one, episode one, like, it's Johnny's story in a lot of ways, even now that the, the scope is so expanded in a lot of ways, it's still Johnny's story or at least his lens for a lot of it. And um, uh, so it, uh, what we did with, with Miguel in this season, um, you know, he's relearning to walk. Johnny helps with that. There's some needle drops in that. Uh, there's, there's some fun uh, scenes of them. Um, and then uh, I think it, it sort of leans into what Zach mentioned a bit about uh, 80s sports movie scoring. That plot kind of hits its uh, zenith in, it, it's either episode seven or eight when they, they go to the city council meeting to like plea for the All Valley to go back on. And like, you know, the three senses, Chris, Johnny and Daniel, like kind of give it their go and, and get snubbed and, and shot down by the council. But then Miguel, you know, the injured hero returning, you know, to, to make the last pitch of the game uh, shows up and like gives this speech. And we went like full blown 
you know, 80s sports uh, inspirational during this speech. Um, although it's all actually based, or a lot of it is based on that uh, training montage synthwave piece, Slither from season one, um, just totally reinterpreted, which is a blast. Um, and, and so that, this season, I would say that's kind of like the, a lot of the uh, Miguel arc, he obviously has a huge moment in the finale too, um, in, in terms of when he's fighting Kyler in the house fight. Um, but that's, uh, you know, that's kind of the arc there. I'd also add really quickly, one other thing that I just was thinking about that this season, we got to score a lot more of Sam kind of in action. Sam is yeah. Daniel's daughter. And like, there are a few cues in this season where we have like fights that are based around kind of Sam's themes, which we did not have. And that's kind of like, because she is now she's, she's coming up, she's suffering for a lot of like PTSD from her from her brawl at the end of season two. And it's her kind of coming to terms with her demons um, and her anxiety and and overcoming that, especially in the in the climax of season three. And that was really fun, too, was like we we hadn't heard uh, Sam's like musical arc in that in that. Way. Yeah, I just I want to jump on there and just add like one of the things we really relish about the show is in, in every new season sort of taking musical ideas that may have started on, on like one instrument and really expanding it into the full breadth of the palette. And whether that is sometimes taking something that was orchestra and doing it on guitar or doing it in synths um, or vice versa, or more often than not, like some hybrid mashup where there's influences all over the place. Like we're always looking for opportunities to do that. This Sam theme is like a really great example of one this season. Now I've got a question from Louis Virtuini. He's first off a huge fan of how you've interpolated the great Bill Conti themes into your own style. And he would love to know which season of Cobra Kai was the most challenging to work on and which one was your favorite and why? Hmm. Ooh. I think maybe, honestly, most challenging might be the first season. Because yeah, I agree. Season, season you one gotta is- find the sound. You got to find the sound. You don't know- quite what everyone is looking for everyone's kind of trying to find their footing and i would say that we didn't even find our footing until like i when i rewatched season one when it went to netflix i was like wow this doesn't really sound like the cobra kai score until like halfway through like episode five yeah. and we start hearing the training montage and we start hearing themes that were like oh you know our one of our big themes didn't even get introduced until episode six and that is always the absolute hardest is is starting a project and um finding what is what's it, like how is it going to be unique and i think after episode 10 the season finale of of, of uh, season one we knew kind of a little more where when we had access to the orchestra because that was like a, we specifically asked for an orchestra for that episode and i think once everyone on the show knew that the possibilities were were much bigger than what we were uh initially thinking maybe um we 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 were able to kind of like hone in on this sound and and i think yeah, going into season two, I remember was a lot easier. Even season three, there's so much music and it's so huge and thick and dense, but I don't think we ever felt that same challenge because we kept coming back to like a lot of the themes that we've just been working with and in new ways. And I think- Yeah, especially agree. because like the show is a, you know, half hour, some right. of them are, half, you know, some of them are a little comedy. longer, some of them are pushing like 40 <laughs> minutes at least, um, some of the bigger episodes, but- you know, when in season one, like you don't get to just be like, okay, it's episode one. Here's every theme for every character. And then we're going to like use them. Like you discover them as you go, like Zach was saying. And so like, we didn't even know what all of our main themes were until really the finale, I would say of that season. And then it was like, oh, okay. Now we can like really kind of tie it together because everyone's in one place and figure out this like thematic scoring. And, and, and so then since then, um, you know, we've just been building off of that foundation. Now, Ed Hartman um, says, great show, incredible series. How has Corona or COVID changed your scoring process? You can only assume that this whole amazing orchestral score was done uh, pre-COVID for season. Yeah, we, we finished this like middle of February, 2020. So a month before the world ended. Um, thank God we snuck it in because like, as you can hear, like the scope is just gigantic. And uh, there, there would have been, if we were six weeks later, there would have been no way to like 
do all of that remotely. Like I feel like now people have found a little more of a groove. Um, so we have not yet had to score Cobra Kai in the COVID era. We're, we're about uh, to. We're about to with yeah. season four. <laughs> um, and we don't know what that'll be like yet. The, uh, so we, we really lucked out. I, I guess more in just like a slightly more general way, um, you know, and everyone will tell you they're like, with their teams are working remotely. Like my assistant used to like come work in my studio every day. And like now he works remotely and we've set up this like extravagant cloud thing so that when I finish a file, he can like prep it for whatever it needs to be done without us having to be physically in the same space. And, uh, you know, we've done some recording on different projects separately and together since then. Uh, I did this crazy thing uh, for the show Pen15 on Hulu where I recorded a kids choir remotely, like individually. And like one way to like finding the singers to do it was like super hard. And one thing that helped was like three of them were siblings from the same family. Oh, so like, <laughs> like, like, so you're always like trying to look for those hacks to figure out like, okay, how can I make this as easy and musical as possible? Um, so it's, it's been a really challenge. It's, it's been a real challenge. I think I'm like, we're fortunate that we haven't had to like answer that question of like, how are we going to record 90 piece orchestra? At least not yet. So we'll see. Wow. Now, Dale Turner, uh, any specific hard rock guitar players you can cite as influences that helped shape the 80s rock aspects of your scoring for the series? Let it loose, sure. Zach. Sure. <laughs> uh, well, let's try to narrow it down to kind of what... I, I, yeah, let's narrow it down a little bit. Yeah, let's to, take to, the to, academic to, approach. To the, yeah, yeah to, the, to the series. I think, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, um, some of my personal really big influences are like, I mean, Kirk Hammett of Metallica, um, even though he's a little, yeah, yeah like, okay, I'm not gonna, Kirk Hammett from Metallica, uh, Marty Friedman, um, Steve Vai, uh, like Joe Satriani, a lot of Japanese fusion guitar players, like uh, bands Cassiopeia and T-Square, Alan Holdsworth, um, like, yeah, tons of, I know, and Leo uh, is a giant Pat Metheny fan. So like Huge a lot of, a lot of Pat Metheny. Um, and what other, like, I, I think, yeah, more, um, and then we also kind of have a lot of like, more like softer rock kind of influences too, like Don Henley and like Brian Adams, like there's some stuff like that in there as well, like kind of yacht rock. There's some like, <laughs> a, a, or like AOR adult oriented rock. I mean, look at us. We got yeah, like, <laughs> we have, I have a mole. <laughs> um, but yeah. We're, we, we're hauling oats over here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Private eyes, dude. That's really good. Um, now, BK West, um, how early do you guys compose the music for a season? The music is absolutely fabulous, perfect for the workplace and for workouts, uh, depending oh, on yeah. the theme. Oh, yeah. We're, we're big on the uh, Cobra Kai workout playlist component of the score. <laughs> we, re we really endorse all, uh, you know, workout vibes. Um, Let's see. We well, we work honestly. We are about the last thing that happens in the season, outside of some like VFX and and the final dub mix. We uh, the the episodes are edited together at least in in rough form when we watch them for the first time. And for every episode, we sit down. We usually do two at a time. We sit with uh, JJH um, and do like a spotting session for two episodes. Um, the pace is often breakneck, as in like there's 10 episodes and they'll have three different editors working in three different rooms. So we'll go over for a spotting session. We'll like be moving around from one editor's room to another to get through episodes. We tend to score two at a time and we'll write. Um, I, I would say like, we'll do those two episodes in like 10 to 14 days, like maybe turn in one of them on day 10 and one of them on day 14. But we frequently will like spot the next episode on like day seven. So it's like this constant overlap where uh, at some point in the middle of the season, we're working on like eight episodes at once because one of them is at the final dub mix and another one we're like just starting writing on because the spotting session was yesterday. Um, but, you know, the it, it kind of the, the end event for the entire season is the final dub mix for the finale. And we are usually finished mixing the episode uh, music wise a day before that or two days before that <laughs> like we're about the last thing that happens 
So David says, Benestra, big hi from David. Hi, <laughs> hi and hugs from Barcelona. Um, he would like to know if there, if someone were to create another TV series about some film character of the '80s and their lives in present day, which would be your favorite to score? Oh, oh man, By it's more way, of a '90s property, but we love to talk about oh. wanting to score the Power Rangers. Like, yeah. like I don't know if it would be the same kind of. Uh, like post nostalgia interpretation that that Cobra Kai is of like a continuation or just like a reboot, but like that would be a blast. Um, honestly, would, man, I, I, the, I I got one. If you've got one, I've, I've got I one. I was just gonna say like I'd love to. I I'd be really into some like Rambo reboot, like yeah. like continuation. <laughs> They've got, they still got those Rambos going, but I would, I mean, yeah, I'd love any type of, I was actually, it's funny, I was going to say like kind of an Arnold Schwarzenegger um, property or like a, or like a Jean-Claude Van Damme thing. Oh you know, yeah. Like a Frank, De, Frank De from Bloodsport would be, uh, would be pretty great. Um, I don't know, would it, it would be fun to, I guess like it would also be fun to uh, try to do something that's like untouchable that people would think like, oh, how could they do this? Like back in the future <laughs> or something like that. Um, there, also, big shout out to David who who helped us out when we were played a, at Mosma Music Fest in 2019. That Back was like when one, live of, one music of our best. Was a thing. Oh, it was the best. It was so much. Yeah, fun. we had a blast. We had a blast. Well, you guys got to play House of the Blues here. I mean, hopefully, when we get some herd herd going on, uh, maybe next year we'll, we'll have you guys. Some back, herd. Uh, <laughs> some herd. <laughs> that was just, yeah, we played that's, in we played, amazing. You could, did you come to that, Dan? You played at the yeah, no, Unfortunately, I missed it, but it must have been a rocking event. Oh, my God. It was so much fun. Really I keep rocking. saying all I want to do is Cobra Kai live at the Greek, full band and orchestra, like outdoor fucking shred fest, Griffith Park 2021. <laughs> like that. that is what I want. The nice thing about that, well, I got to say real quick is like we played this live show. We played two live shows in night 2019, one at the Whiskey A Go Go in Los Angeles, which was the perfect venue for Cobra Kai, just a grimy 80 Sunset Strip. And then uh, it's where Johnny would have gone, where he yeah. would have snuck in. Yeah. <laughs> and we played at Mosma Music, uh, you know, Film Music Festival in Spain and in Malaga, and that was awesome. And that was pre Netflix, mm -hmm. and it was a blast. And now we can only imagine just the type of response that we would get if we played live. And we've already we're kind of getting more stats about like who's listening and. We see all the cities that it's kind of popular in and it would just be, we like cannot wait because maybe we'll do like a mini tour or something. We have like this full live set with lights and visuals and an amazing player. It's really so, fun. Yeah. Now we're going to jump back to Funty and he would love to know um, which character themes and motifs did each of you enjoy creating the most? Oh man, we got a, we got a whole, we got a whole lot of them. Um, Let's see some some big highlights. I think maybe we should we we should talk about some of the season three ones specifically. Mm -hmm. um, the because we have a couple new themes. There's a there's a brand new theme for Okinawa that you hear in episode four um, when uh, when Daniel sees Kumiko and there's a bunch of like flashback uh, Karate Kid two footage, um, and it just turned out gorgeously. Uh, if you have the soundtrack album, the the track is Return to Okinawa. Um, there is a theme that was actually one of the earliest things we wrote for Cobra Kai, but then it was homeless for a little bit. It is a track called Awake the Snake, and it's on our season one album. We ended up using it as like the, the finale end credits of season two. And in, in season three, it became this sort of John Kreese backstory theme, because it's like the it is where the you know the snake is born um there's this motif that goes like and we just found it to be really malleable um you know when you see young crease you hear it as like a solo horn elegy you know super patriotic soldier style um it sounds amazing on like strings churning in some of the really kind of tragic sections in the in the finale um, fight, especially in like the last 15 minutes, like you really hear that doing a lot of work in, in terms of like building the, the the anguish in the orchestra as there's some like big twists with the reveals. Um, 
And uh, yeah, that that's a big one for season three. We, uh, as I mentioned before, like um, Slither in in uh, season one, uh, Miguel's training montage in episode five has has found its way into a lot of uh, Miguel centric cues, especially including that uh, you know '80s uh, sports nostalgia nod in the uh, in the city council meeting. Um, one of the biggest themes in the series uh, is is uh, a track called Quiver on the season one album that uh, Zach mentioned this before, but it's uh, at the end of episode six in season one. And it's when Hawk returns to the dojo and is transformed into Hawk for the first time. And uh, that has kind of become the Cobra Kai dojo theme. You hear it all over the place in all different instrumentation. Um, we just, we really love working with our themes. Like if, if we listed them all, we'd be here for an hour. Cause there's probably 15 that deserve mention that are like all very prominent and unique and sort of related to different characters and feelings. Um, you know, there's Johnny's got a theme that's set up in episode one. Uh, Daniel has, there's a couple themes with Daniel. One of them we call the like Miyagi memories theme that's set up in a flashback in the very second episode. That's kind of a more, uh, reflective uh, approach to like Miyagi. And then in season two, we added a new theme for like the Miyagi Do Dojo. It's more of like a, 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 I don't know, call to arms kind of. And that evolved in the trip to Okinawa. And then, uh, you know, gets some really prominent displays in that final fight when Dale shows up. Like it is this constant uh, tapestry of of themes and characters. And, and it's, uh, I, I think it's one thing that helps keep all those different palettes that we draw from in the score really tied together is just that it's it's really thematic writing. You know, one thing I really love about the series is that even the most good or evil characters have like a bad or a good side about them, you know, and especially, uh, you know, in Kreese's case, uh, in this, you, you find out exactly how he got where he was, or even the bad girl that, you know, her mother is bedridden. And how important is it for you to kind of make sure you give that dimension to the characters, you know, where, again, it, it's really astonishing how even the worst characters have just like a mul another layer to them, you know, especially musically. It's really important to us because that's, I think, the whole, the, the, that's the special sauce in the show is that whenever someone is texting me about the show and they're saying like, God, like, I, you know, like, I don't, I don't like Robbie or like, I don't like this character, or, like they're so bad or, or whatever. And I was like, are they really bad? Like, to me, it just seems like Robbie's just like tough in a, in a tough situation or Tori's got a really, you know, a hard situation at home, which like Miguel in the show brings up to Sam at certain points and like that causes friction. So we love that about the show. And I think that's what everyone loves is that there, it, it, there are so many gray areas and you really yeah. can't get it. You can't get away with calling someone bad or good. And we use music um, a lot to, to help you to, to help the uh, enforce that narrative. And one of my favorite uh, moments of that actually is um, at the end, the big tournament at the end of season one, um, we slowly, I think through the music guide, you know, along with the story on the screen, but through the music guide, the tone that, that leads you from rooting to Miguel to rooting for Robbie. And, and by the end of that tournament, I think that like, you know, our music for Robbie becomes more triumphant. Our, our music for Robbie becomes more um, like satisfactory and, and epic and just like beautiful and, and playing with him. And, and then Miguel starts to, every time we see Miguel now we start to morph um, it gets a little bit darker. It gets a little bit darker, and then we end that that sequence with playing Johnny pretty morosely. And when when they've won the tournament, um, it is not like a celebratory cue. And this is someone you've been rooting for the entire season. And then we finally get to the end, and he wins, and you're not really rooting for him. But I think the music plays a really big role in that. There's no dialogue really. It's just kind of like what is the music communicating to you to to feel and who to root for. Oh, a quick note from David says he wants to tell you that he uh, misses playing cowbell with you guys for whatever. That <laughs> um, 
you know, again, I just love how you use Bill Conti. And, you know, before even, you know, getting our return trip to Okinawa, you know, Verez Saraband for, first put out, you know, Karate Kid 1 and 2 and then La La Land, uh, who are doing, you know, the all of the fiscal CDs. They put out, like, complete editions of 1, 2, 3. So, okay, we're going back to Okinawa. Do you, like, suddenly, like, break out the Karate Kid 2 soundtrack and, like, dissect the score? To, okay, we're going to use this theme, you know, to, to do our flashback here. I mean, do you really... This is, of- this is actually really interesting because yeah we we haven't gotten a huge chance to talk about this but there is a sequence in the beginning of episode five in season three that is uh basically like a karate kid two rescore um there's the the scene where chosen shows up to uh you know the ceremony and, and like starts his like death match with daniel um actually had no music in it up until sort of the climax of it. But in the con, like the, this episode in season three starts with this scene. And in the context of this, this storytelling where that scene is no longer the climax of the movie, but actually like a flashback in, in the service of like this current story, um, we, we like, we basically just did our own thing entirely and scored this scene for the first time ever. And we tried to give it, um, a very like kind of retro feel in terms of like the instruments we used and and just kind of the style of of writing um but it, w- it was like a really fun uh dive into the karate is there there's even film music school footage. yeah there's even some footage that isn't even in the movie because they have access to some extra oh, footage wow, cool. and so there are a few shots that have never been seen before and we uh we got to do them um in terms of conti the big Conti uses in Okinawa um, are when Daniel's in the cab driving uh, to Tomi Village. And like, actually, that is just straight the actual recording from 1980. Well, hey, what year was Karate Kid 2? 86, maybe? 85. Like, 85, yeah. So it's, yeah. it's just the straight recording for that one big sequence. Um, and every once in a while, we put a not, we have one Conti kind of accompaniment figure that we like to to use occasionally this like boom 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 oh, which yeah. is sort of the thing that's always accompanying when there's like the Zamfir flutes happening in the original karate kid um but we find that one is uh malleable enough that you can you can fit it in when you need to like evoke a little conti but like maybe not necessarily have it be the focus of what's going on um yeah it's it's fun it's a it, a lot of the times in uh, like that taxi cab sequence, like if there needs to be Conti, we will like, they will just license the original Conti um, to, to get the full evocative feeling. Cause those recordings have such a character, you know, like it'd be a shame to re-record the material and change it. So now we get into two of the inevitable season four. I think out of what they said will be six seasons, but it could go on for 20 seasons. I'm, I'm, I'm totally <laughs> down with that. <laughs> there's, mean, there's no end to the Karate Kid mythology. There is no <laughs> end. Uh, now, Damon um, would love to know, I, I imagine you guys are going to be scoring season four. And where where do you want a season four score to go? Because I think, again, forgive my my rank uh, lack of knowledge about Karate Kid three, which I only saw once. But I think one of the characters from Karate Kid three shows up at the at the end of the at the end of season three. So I mean, what if the if the, the bad guy Ian Smith, uh, I think from three, comes back in, or what if we get Hillary Swank to come back? You know. Yeah. You know who's never yeah. met anybody. You know we don't. Uh, we, we should we, we say quite... that like we literally know nothing about season yeah, four. Like anything. as of right now, so our guess is as good as everyone's. They did plant uh, in the crease flashbacks one of those. Right. Uh, one of his like war buddies w- was revealed to be uh, Terry Silver from right. Karate yeah. Kid Three, and they sort of they did a really funny misdirect in the show because there's a guy who looks just like him who then gets killed. And then, like, it's the other friend who's actually Terry Silver. Um, but, uh, you know, suppo- like, in theory, he is who Kreese calls at the end, but it doesn't say it explicitly. So yes, like, yeah, maybe exactly, it's yeah. another just crazy misdirect. I think uh, for us, um, what we're excited about for season four is, like, you know, the big end of season three is, like, uh, Daniel and Johnny are teaming up. And, like... They've got these joint dojo and like 
what what is that going to sound like? Like, how are we going to weave our themes in there? Like that, I think, is what we are, you know, thinking about right now, pretty much knowing nothing. What would you like to see happen if you if you if someone magically gave you <laughs> the season he made you the showrunners? Uh, where would you want to see the, these characters go? What would you love? What characters would you like to see come back? I I really loved seeing. Um... I really loved in season three seeing Miguel and Daniel interact. Yeah, it was really special. I thought, and I think something so cool about the show is you have so many characters. A lot of them don't share a lot of screen time together. Um, and I think so. Seeing we're gonna see Miguel with Daniel, I assume because they're kind of in the same dojo now. So I'd like to see some of that, and um, you know, maybe we'll get a. Uh, you know, a COVID friendly underground audience list blood sport style uh Kumite tournament. Would that would yeah. be that's kind of like what I would like to <laughs> that see. That would be sick. Um with some real stakes, blood. Uh but like yeah, I, I we really don't know. I think and I think in terms of score, we're just gonna try to I think we I, I think we are definitely going we've talked about kind of in regards to COVID, how we're gonna approach it and who knows, maybe by the time we actually start, who knows? Like we might be in a better spot. But yeah, we definitely would would choose to lean in more into uh, you know, a COVID friendlier score uh that that may involve maybe like really digging into those like Vince DeCola style sim strings. Like maybe that's what we end up doing this season. But we just got to see. I think there's always going to be a place for an orchestra. Um, and, you know, again, maybe maybe they tone it down on their end and the se- on, on the showrunners. And, like, we just don't know anything. Yeah. Um, Louis would love to know, what are there any themes that have not been used? You know, you re- refer to stuff that's kind of orphan orphan themes and such. Would you, what, are, what themes have we not heard that you would love to show up in a season four? Facebook user. <laughs> it's Louie. <laughs> um do we have a lot of stuff on the gosh i don't know if we have uh now that we've created now that we've turned awake the snake into such a, an important oh. theme oh you got, got one I've, I've got an answer so okay side note we did the cobra cobra kai video game which came out um in october so the Cobra Kai video game is a like a kind of in the style of like a classic side scrolling beat em up game. Everyone should play it. It's actually a total blast. And we did the music and it's basically like extended Cobra Kai universe music. We didn't use any of the show's themes. It's all new material. Wow. Um, and a, some of the material that is in some of those levels are version ones of fights that got thrown out on the show. So like I'm thinking of what is now hallway hellscape. Um, there was a version one of that that was thrown out. It didn't work. And we ended up taking that and u- using like the foundation of that for the, our video game level shopping mall. But um, it's, it was, I, I actually like, we love the video game music. We love the score to that. And because video game music is such a big part of our influence for the show um and you can hear that and people always say like this sounds like a boss battle i was like great like that's what it's supposed yeah to that like. that's um, what we were going for <laughs> so yeah i think some but we don't have a ton of stuff we always kind of find a home for it especially now um but you know what i'm sure there's there's stuff that uh we're not thinking of maybe we'll see the light of day one day now before we wrap our show up i mean any cl- any final thoughts about just what the unexpected monster deserved monster hit cobra kai has become and just this the sensation of it it's man it it's like really special and like honestly emotional for us because like we've you know we started this show in 2017 and it was a hit when it came out on youtube but it was like and youtube's huge like 100 almost 100 million people have like watched that first episode on YouTube. It's insane. Um, but there's there was like a certain uh, semi-permeable barrier like surrounding it as long as it was on YouTube. Like it either what just like wasn't getting in front of enough eyeballs because like the YouTube audience was rather limited or it just like wasn't kind of being taken as seriously like with the, the amount of prestige as some other shows, even though it is like such a quality piece of, filmmaking really um and so like the move to netflix has just changed everything in terms of it like it it is now like cobra kai is full-blown like zeitgeist 
like literally everyone has seen it. Um, something like 73 million households have watched at least one episode. Like that's an insane number. Like that's like, that's like 40% of all Netflix subscriptions in the world, which is mind blowing. Um, it, like before I feel like, you know, on a personal level, like all my friends knew I did Cobra Kai, but not many of them had watched it. And now like everybody has seen Cobra Kai and like all they want to do is like text me about Cobra Kai and how in love with the characters they are. And I think one sort of interesting thing that has really like affected Zach and I and our interaction with like the fans of the show is that like, because the, the, the fans were like, so kind of like small and mighty the first time around, like we've been really caught up in the like, uh, I don't know, like brain trust of the show from like the fans perspective. And like, people are really big fans of the soundtrack. And like, I think like, it, it's cool that just like Cobra Kai fans are like tweeting at us constantly about the show in the same tweet that they're tweeting at like Billy and Ralph or in like JJH and like, like people love to hear about the music. And I think we're really excited about the season three soundtrack. Like, like we just think it's like a kick ass, like movie score album. Like I, I hope people think that. And it seems like, you know, it, I think if it had still come out on YouTube, like people wouldn't treat it as seriously, but like now uh, th that's kind of the feedback we get. And it's like really special because we, we put so much work into it and, and it's just cool to have that kind of platform just open up for you. It makes a huge difference like on a professional level when people know about Cobra Kai, but it's different when people watch it, like people hiring you watch it, you yeah. know, people in the, in the industry watch it. And it's also, yeah, as Leo said, like it's incredibly special to us and to me that like my grandmother can watch it easily on Netflix and text me. Oh about, yeah, or, like, my grandmother Not text me, but she... It. My grandma called me and said she really liked when Ralph Macchio opened up his own karate store, uh, quote unquote. <laughs> um, but that is, yeah, seeing the, the reaction from just our family members and our friends, um, it just makes it, it makes us feel really good. Like it's it's just an amazing feeling. And it's so I say this all the time, but like it is incredibly rare to work on a show with amazing people and collaborators a show where your music really feels like your voice, like you don't feel like you're compromising mm -hmm. anything. And then for that show to be a massive success, like that combination is is so rare. So we we really like every day, we're just so like happy to think about that we get another shot at doing another season because who knows when it stops. And even when it does stop, when it's time to stop, it's gonna be like a really sad day. Well, hopefully that day is not going to happen for <laughs> quite a while. Zach and Leo, I just want to thank you so much for joining us at Film Music Live. Watch all seasons of Cobra Kai, now streaming on Netflix, and get their soundtracks on La La Land Records and Madison Gate Records. And on January 19th, La La Land Records will sweep the leg. They released the uh, physical season one CD. And now coming, Cobra Kai Seasons 2 and 3 will show no mercy on CD. And if you're watching now on YouTube, please hit our subscriber button and click the bell to get reminders of when we upload new Film Music Live videos. And a huge thanks to our show producers, Kathy Ng and Mark Northam, our moderator and co-producer, Dale Turner, publicists, Andrew and Brittany, and La La Land Records. Uh, check out new shows on our YouTube page and at the Film Music Network on Facebook, and tune in to our next show as Alex Sounder Desplat will descend to talk about scoring the end of the world with the midnight sky. All right, everyone. Oh, wow. See you. Uh, I will get, hit the workout, Matt. We'll see everyone on the next Film Music Live. Thanks, Dan. Bye, everybody. Thank Thanks, you. Exactly. Bye. Bye.